morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Pradeep, uh, for having me here. I'm going to take you through a small talk on indications for trabeculectomy and for trabeculectomy and preoperative considerations. And I'm standing here because I thought I'd like to point out some things which would have been difficult to do otherwise standing on the dais, actually. So we all know the indications uh, of trabeculectomy. Uh, so this is right out of a book that in cases where other forms of therapy namely medicine or laser have failed in cases where other forms of therapy are not suitable, uh, where compliance or side effects are a problem or appropriate medical treatment is not available, in cases where a target pressure is unable to be achieved and when at presentation the intraocular pressure is so high and optic disc damage is so significant that mm. surgery becomes the first choice and of course obvious progressive glaucomatous damage, when that becomes evident then you know that perhaps it's time to consider surgery actually. And the efficacy of surgery and even early surgery was demonstrated several years ago through some landmark publications that came out mainly from uh, Britain and also uh, from the United States actually. Now in order to understand what happens in our clinic, you know, I'm deviating from the so-called script and taking you through two or three cases to tell you what happens when we have the patients and how do we consider when to do surgery and do we always, are we always on time when we, when there is an indication of surgery or sometimes do we miss the early signs and later on realize or oh, perhaps it might have been better had I done surgery or treated this patient in a different way. So this is a 64 year female and she came in 2007, she had a family history of glaucoma in her grandmother. Now, of course, I don't know how she would know that because her grandmother would have been extremely, she would have been extremely young when her grandmother would have got glaucoma in those days. I, I don't know where, how much glaucoma was, um, you know, there was awareness actually. But anyhow, she came to us with an intraocular pressure of 26 and 25 millimeters of mercury. As all of you know, there's a huge debate about, you know, what do you do if you find a patient that comes to you and the disc looks absolutely normal and the pressure is 25 or 26, you know, do you treat this patient or do you, do you just follow up actually? Anyhow, so no treatment was given at that point. Uh, no treatment was given at that point and unfortunately she didn't come back very quickly and then she was seen after a few years in April of 2011 with intraocular pressure of 19 and 18 millimeters of mercury she had, as you would notice, a pachymetry of 566 and 559 microns. You know, a little bit justification that a little high intraocular pressure, normal optic disc, perhaps not to do anything with this patient. Now, when she came back in 2011, we did the OCT and that showed that the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness appeared to, be, appeared to be within normal limits in both eyes. And this is what the disc looked like. Now, when you take a look at the disc, there is a huge possibility that you might say, well, everything just looks all right, you know, where's the problem actually? And then when we went over the photograph, we realized that this disc is not following the isn't rule. So at first glance, everything looks just right, but the inferior rim is thin and that was missed in the clinic actually. And we just figured it out when we were making this talk, you know. And if you take a look at the retinal nerve fibula, everything looks just perfect. And again, we missed that there was some early sign. So even though the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is in the green zone, the first signs that were evident were missed. And you can see this small dip here. This dip was the first sign that early nerve fiber layer loss started in the right eye. And this dip here, even though it's a little eccentric, was another sign in the left eye that early retinal nerve fiber layer loss had started taking place actually. So in March 2014, uh, with an intraocular pressure of 20-21, when she was on levobumilol and bimatoprost eye drops, we found that she had developed retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. And you can see that the inferior rim has given way in both eyes and the same point where I showed you the arrows last time, although it was in the green zone, we found that she had developed this actually. So, and this is just to compare the rim, inferior rim in 2011 and the inferior rim in 2014 in the right eye and in the left eye. So then with an intraocular pressure of 16 millimeters of mercury in both eyes and all the changes that I've just shown you, she decided not to undergo glaucoma surgery but just underwent a cataract surgery which was done last year in 2015. And when last seen in February 2016, 
she had an intraocular pressure of 20 and both eyes she had been started on alpha agonists and beta blockers the option of glaucoma surgery has been explained and given to her the indication for surgery is evident from progressive glaucomatous damage and loss of follow up between 2011 and 2014 was significant for her actually so there are several lessons that we learn from a patient like this that never give up on a glaucoma patient if the intraocular pressure is a little bit high don't let go of this patient call the patient back for follow up and look at the test that you have in front of you so having a color photograph of the optic disc in front and having the OCT and yet missing out signs in both these photographs just because everything was green or because the rim looked healthy and not really comparing the inferior rim to the superior rim to identify the first few signs you know those are the things that we need to take care of actually so this is another case study a 55 year female who presented to us in February 2010 with diminution of vision left eye since four to five days and she was diagnosed in the left eye as impending CRVO because there was significant vascular dilatation she had asthma uh, suffered from this thyroid disease and hypertension since 20 years the vision was 6669 and in February 2010 again uh, she had intraocular pressure was 22 and 24 in the left eye actually so we have a patient with impending CRVO with an intraocular pressure of 24 uh, at this point we noticed disc hemorrhages um, and multiple scattered hemorrhages and a decision was taken by the retina specialist that she needed an injection of Aston perhaps because of the macular edema and PRP laser because of the ischemia that had developed unfortunately after this treatment the patient did not come back for a follow-up and when she came back in January 2012 that's just one and a half year later the intraocular pressure was 32 it was 28 in the left eye she had developed 85% cupping in the right eye, 75% cupping. She had significant retinal nerve fiber layer loss in both eyes. So we started her on these drops, but she underwent trabeculectomy in 2012 in both eyes. She did quite well. The intraocular pressure was 10 and 11. And then in 2014, we noticed that there was progression of retinal nerve fiber layer loss compared to 2012, although the intraocular pressure was just 13 and 14. And we started her again on prostaglandin eye drops and I don't know whether it was the pressure that led to progressive retinal nerve fiber layer loss or it was the significant intraocular pressure before the surgery and this was just a continuation of those effects and that is well known in glaucoma subjects actually so in February 2016 the intraocular pressure is 11 and 12 and she's stable for the time being actually so this also uh, was a great learning experience for all of us this is how she was initially without glaucoma and this is how she was um, in 2012 and you can see the thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer in both eyes actually 2014 and then 2016 and you can see the changes in the retinal nerve fiber layer that have taken place uh, so, um, so, so I think that uh, following up of subjects continues to be very very important this is another patient um, he was not compliant and uh, he was not able to use the drops appropriately. He presented in 2015 with intraocular pressure of 17 in the right eye, 25 in the left eye. He had significant cupping in both the right and left eye with significant retinal nerve fiber layer loss. He had uh, decreased central corneal thickness and his non-compliance index, this is an in-house index that we've developed, was about 16% actually. He underwent right eye trabeculectomy and left eye trabeculectomy. And I just want to show this to you that, you know, when someone is non-compliant or not able to put the drops, you know, he had so many, he had a score of nine actually, didn't wash his hands, bottle cap was not opened properly, upper eyelid was elevated, bottle nozzle touched the eyelashes, more than one drop was instilled, eyes were not closed, there was squeezing of eyelids, eyes rubbed post-drop installation, nasolacrimal passage not pressed, you know. So with non-compliance, if you have this kind of a patient in front of you, then perhaps that is already an important indication along with the retinal nerve fiber layer loss and disc damage that, that it, it tends to spur you towards uh, considering uh, glaucoma surgery actually. Am I out of time? This is the last slide, okay. Okay, as far as preoperative considerations are concerned, uh, remember with myobobitis, be cautious, it gives rise to a lot of conjunctival congestion. Um, conjunctival scarring is something that you need to notice preoperatively especially in revision surgeries 
and use of drops like prostaglandins and pilocarpine may be stopped sufficiently ahead of time actually. So follow up and optic disc assessment remain critical. Every labeled glaucoma suspect should also be followed up. Those considered predisposed to the development of glaucoma should also be followed up. It is the identification of indications, indications at the appropriate time that will enable us to treat our patients better. Thank you all very much.